we record this. Okay, so I think what we're going to do is uh, to spend some time to discuss the homework. So I already great all of them. And I think uh, most of you done a good job. But I still want to go through this uh, problem. So what's the best way? Uh, yeah, I don't think I need to show much. It would be good to show something. Uh, yeah, the, the first problem is a matching problem, right? So let me just repeat the question. It's something like, uh, it's just like a boy and girl matching, but the difference in this case is that uh, you match an applicant, which is doctor, to hospital. So each hospital can accept more than one doctor. And uh, we also know that uh, we have uh, more students or doctor applicants than the number of slots in the hospital, right? And then the, what we want to do is some kind of matching algorithm. You want to make sure that uh, uh, it's a stable. There is slightly different definition of stable. One definition is that uh, you don't want the situation a student was not admitted because always there is some student never, not admitted to a medical school to say particular medical school one, but uh, in the, in the uh, hospital's ranking for all the students, this student not admitted is better than the one admitted. Then obviously it's not right. And the other situation is that uh, you don't have a, a swapping situation, right? similar to like a stable marriage. For example, you have a hospital one and two, and you have two students, they, they prefer the, the other one, and the student also prefer the other hospital, then you should do a swap. Then the, the question is asked you to come up with a solution. I think most students did the right. Uh, by the way, I'm not saying that, uh, uh, I think a lot of solution to those questions that can be found on the website. So what you really need to try to do, at least for the future homework assignment, try to solve it by yourself. If you cannot solve, then you can search the internet. At least you will learn something. So why I did not get the right answer. I think all students did the right. And uh, although a couple of students did not give any explanation, then obviously I have to deduct a point, like a 0 0.5. Means that they just give an algorithm without explaining why this is correct. You have to give them. And you need to mention, although did not ask for complexity, you should ask what's the degree of complexity, which is n times m. Say n is number of slots available in hospital. Or well, then the M is the number of applicants. Okay. And uh, so for each problem, what you need to do is try to remember those problems. That's why I give a homework assignment. I try to remember all these solutions. Think about extension. One possible extension why nobody tried the other way around? So right now it's like a, a hospital take the initiative. Right. So it means that hospital rank all the students go after the first student. Then the first student, just like a female, just accept whatever the first hospital. Then later, if more hospital are coming to invite, if that new hospital has a higher priority, they kick out the old hospital. The old hospital will continue searching. The difference is uh, with uh, boy and girl matching, each hospital has a number of slots. So you can go after several candidates, right? So that's the solution. Anyone think about the other way around? What happened if a student take the initiative going after the hospital? Will this work? Can we have some discussion? Anyone want to discuss that? What's the pros and cons? It's the same, it's like a boy initiate and the other ones go initiate. Uh, obviously this situation is slightly different because in this case we have uh, more students 
then number of slots in hospital. Will this cause a problem or this is not really a problem? Anyone want to say something? Come on, anyone want to say something? Don't be shy, I mean, it's okay to make an error. Anything wrong? Why nobody, just, just curious, why all the homework question, answer, they all say that the student the hospital take the initiative and go after the students instead of student going after the hospital. Will this make a difference? I mean, when I was solving it, uh, my logic was somehow that in the real world, uh, the hospitals would make the most profit. And as we know, like when men choose, then it's uh, men, like uh, then the it's best scenario for men. And when women choose, then it's best for women. So my assumption was when hospitals choose that it's optimal for hospitals. Yeah, but, but in reality, you could have a, give a candidate, doctors, uh, the benefit, right? In fact, if suppose, so I'll let you think about whether well, correctness or practicality, in terms of practicality. Uh, in reality, probably the number of students uh, or, or doctor candidates uh, similar to maybe slightly more than the faculty, uh, hospital slots. But do you know that in reality, when uh, a student apply for medical school, there are not many uh, choices. Usually they select, for example, 10 schools, right? Not just 100, right? I think in US, there are a little bit over 100 medical school. So would it be better if a student take the initiative, just ask a 10, 10 right? It's not all to all matching. It's uh, just uh, whatever the 10 top, Whatever your ten, go for that. That may be more efficient. I don't know, so you can think about that. Because in the way you you you, you submit applicants uh, applications, it takes time. There's no way you can apply one hundred school. I forgot. Maybe you have to. Uh, you have to submit the uh, application fee. So in reality, you will not accept one hundred school. Okay. So this is the first one we can think about. Uh, so which is an interesting problem. The second problem, I think most students did it right, but uh, some cases uh, students did not generalize. Right? So I think I explained this in the board and uh, see if you can see it. Uh, yeah, so you can see it here, right? So the key thing that I start with uh, two, then ask you to for n is a three. Three means a. So what you can do is that you can have like a, you can see, right? A, B, C, D. So three, four person. The key thing, I, some student uh, made mistake, maybe totally misunderstood the question. So it's not like a boy and girl matching. It's a single gender, like a roommate. So suppose you have this kind of ranking B, C, uh, D. This ranking is a C, uh, A, D. This ranking is a, a, B, D. This ranking actually doesn't matter, A, B, C. So can you see this, right? So the key thing is this one, is that uh, this poor guy, D, was ranked the last among all the, all the other or the other one. So this guy will have a trouble, but this is not enough. And all the other one, A, B, C, was ranked at least once the top. For example, A is the top of C. C is the top of B. B is top of A, that's the key. Okay, so that means all the other guys is ranked number one in at least one, one person. Okay, so now let's look at the scenario. No matter how D married, uh, whatever, or roommate with the other one, like D and A, you can see, right? 
D and B, D and C. And uh, it will not be stable because when you have this situation, B and C will pair, right? So this is one group and B, D, and then you have A, C, another group. If a D, C, then A, B, A, doesn't matter. Then the, in that situation, uh, because you see that D is always the last one in anyone's ranking. So C, A will not be very happy. A will not be very happy, right? And among B and C, we already say that for any other person other than D well, is a rank at the top. So either B or C will like A, then the current partner. So willing to switch, right? So willing to switch. Same argument for the D and B, the D is a rank last among B. So B is not happy. And um, then about C and A, at least one will rank A better than uh, its current partner. So they're willing to do a swap. Right? So that means that's the situation. So like uh, in, in the previous case, uh, B or C, so so A so C will be happy with A. So C and A will form a new partner, right? So in this case, uh, B is a rank uh, top by A. So obviously, A will prefer to stay with B than C. And uh, for last one, C is a rank uh, top by the B. So C and B. You don't need to ask opinion of a C because C, no one like D, okay? So with this, you can generalize for six, right? Three pair. So in general, your correct solution should be for any N, N. All you need to do is that uh, there is one guy ranked last among all the other one. And his ranking actually doesn't really matter. Then the second condition, each person other than the last person will be ranked exactly one top one in at least one case. So in this like ABC, right, the top. Then no matter how you do kind of pairing, uh, you, you may come up something. So you can generalize this. Uh... Okay, so this is the, the second one. Uh, let's uh, look at, uh, let me see. What's the next one? Oh, next one is the one with uh, all this ranking, right? So I think most students did correct means the complexity. This is just a simple mathematics. I assume you've done all this data structure and program technique, so you know this stuff. So I'm not going to go through this. Uh, oh, let me share the screen. Share the screen. Can you see it? So you can see this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to chapter. By the way, I got the electronic copy of that. So I can show the, the questions, each question. Anyone remember? Which question? I think question number two. It's a little tricky, but I think most students did the right. Oh, well, by the way, the, the good thing about this book is that at the end, before exercise, so they gave us some kind of example and showed the solution. So you can follow the same example. So this shows like a minimal spanning tree. I'm glad that uh, I explained minimal spanning tree. So which is extended the Dijkstra algorithm, right? It's a Prince algorithm. So the idea is you, you select the one edge at a time with a minimum and you, eventually you, you find a spanning tree. So the question is that if the cost, which is a positive number is changed to from C to C square, for example, two become four, right? 
And then the, will this uh, spanning tree still valid? Uh, true or false? If it's, uh, so give a simple explanation. In this case is correct. So because you, you calculate the, the cost for each edge. It's accumulation of each edge summation. Okay, in other words, if you have a C and C prime, and C is less than C prime, then the, um, the square also satisfies it. It's just, then the second one is a force. Why second one is a force? because we calculate the shortest pass and it's accumulate the, the, the distance. I think the best way is to give you an example. I show on the board, again, show on the board. You can see it, erase this. I guess you can see this. So suppose this is the pass information, right? And suppose this is two, two, three. So this is the source, this is the destination. You can see, right? So in the shortest pass from this to this is a three. So it's good. So what happens if we change uh, into square? And this, this will be four, this will be four, this will be nine, right? So obviously this is no longer the shortest one. Now you have four plus four is eight. So that's the shortest pass. Okay, so that's a four. So all you need to do is just give an example. So I think uh, most students did it right without any problem. Okay, now let's go to slice again and share. Uh, what's the next question? Anyone remember which one? Is it uh, 15? Sir, sir, 13 and 15. Uh, 13 and 15. Let's see, 13. Oh, a small business. Actually, this is a, is a, is a tricky problem. I'm surprised that all students did the correct, right? So it's good. So I hope you will be able to solve problem in the, in the midterm. Actually, this uh, is not easy problem. Let's just read this. A small business, say a photocopying service with a single large machine facing the following scheduling problem. Each morning they get a lot of job from the customer. They want to do the job on the single machine in order to keep that the customers happy, happiest. Customer I's job takes a TI time, take time to complete. Give a schedule in the order of the job and let the CI denote the finishing time of job CI, right? So for example, if a job J is scheduled to do uh, first to be done, then we will have a cost of a TJ, which is simple. And then if a job J is done right after job I, then the time is a C I plus T J, which is T I plus T J. If the, each customer is also has a weight W I, so that makes things difficult. It's not like it's same, it's some customer is more important than the other one in, in that sense. That represent uh, his or her importance to the business. The happiest of customer is expected to be depending on the finishing time of I's job. So the company decide that they want to order the job to minimize the weight the sum of completion time. Completion time, right? Weighted the sum of completion time. So that means that you want, they want to minimize the summation of all this uh, completion time. Minimize, but also wait. So you don't look at each one, but it's a whole, just a, a, a summation of all the completion time, but there's a weighted completion time. So you have one goal, right? So design an efficient algorithm to solve the problem. 
That is, you're given a set of in job and how you prioritize them. So why this is uh, more difficult? Uh, difficult in the sense that whether it's based on the duration or based on the weight, uh, duration really means the time and the other one is the weight. In fact, it's neither. It's based on the ratio. Now the question is that what, how you uh, prioritize them so that uh, you will get the minimum weight, minimum, minimum uh, uh, weighted sum. So again, let's look at the example, okay? And we solve uh, one simple example, then we generalize this one. So suppose you have a, a one. Have a, a one. What? Can you see it? Yes. Oh, you can see that. So you have a T1 uh, weight is one. Then the other one is the T2 weight two. So what you try to do is that uh, you want to see it. if you schedule T1 first, that's a finishing time, right? Can you see it? Then the other one is a way two, T1 plus T2. So that, that's the, the one. Then what you try to compare with the other option is a way two, T2 plus way one, T1, plus T2, is that uh, the way, right? So then the, suppose this one should be smaller than this one. Then you want to see what's the condition. So you want to compare these two. So you pick a, a whichever small then you should pick a, what is scale. This means that you schedule one followed by two, this was two followed by one. Well, then you do a very simple manipulation. So you see that's a common term. So this term can eliminate with this. Right? And this term can be eliminated with uh, this and this. So what's left over is W2T1 less than W1T2. Can you see that? Yeah, I think you can do that. Then you can put the uh, one thing aside and just uh, T1 divided by W2 less than T2 divided by W2 or whatever the order. Right? So that's, is it correct? So that's the key. So this is the, the ratio. Okay, so, so that means this based on this ratio, you can, uh, at least for two jobs, this is best schedule. Look at the ratio, whichever ratio is small, the issue schedule. But I think uh, most students stop there. In reality, how you prove this one for general case, and you have an end job, end job. So what are you going to do? So this actually uh, uh, is important, right? But you see that when you try to find the optimal solution, you have to test it for simple cases. Then what you try to generalize uh, for, for all this. So what you, what you try to do is that, uh, see, oh, since this look like the ratio is important. So why don't we do this? Uh, so can we do some kind of hypothesis such that, uh, well, you can have an equal, it doesn't really matter. So if you have a, a lots of them and you rank all this based on this ratio, right? Then we say that, uh, we just uh, based on the order of one, two, all the way to n. That's the best schedule. But how you prove this is the optimal. Yeah. Right. Then you can prove uh, based on induction or other way. But fortunately, we just learned last class about inversion, right? Remember the inversion problem? Inversion means that uh, you, you have this one, like an order, then uh, let's just have some, suppose we have uh, five, right? So inversion, you can have like a four, two, one, uh, five, three. Okay, four, two, one, five, three. So that, or in other words, you randomly pick any sequence, 
you prove that uh, this one is better than this one. So how you do that? All you need to do is just do some kind of inversion. Right? So inversion really means that you swap, you swap adjacent to swap. Then to do one by one, eventually you will, you will get it. So that's simple. So, so let, let's just look at, you can do whatever order. You can have what, two, one, you swap one at a time. And one, four, two, five, six. Oh, you can just do whatever that's order. Swap the Remy, you swap this, you, you swap with this. Eventually you swap all the way to one, two, three, four, five. So the key is that adjacent to swap. Adjacent swap, then you can use the same argument we did. Remember the, this uh, T1, T2. Although you may have others, other number ahead of that, but it doesn't really matter because it's a common term you can eliminate, right? So you can do this kind of argument uh, in sequence. Eventually you see that everything can be reduced to this one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that's the one simple. You, did you get that? Okay, so this is the solution. Uh, let me see. I think I need to go back to to share again. Let's look at the, the last one. Uh, last one is a uh, fifteen. I think again most students did uh, correct, uh, but I want you to solve it a little bit hard problem and think about that. And this is uh, interesting. Uh, so this is about a team, right? Suppose you, you're a manager. You're a manager and then you have uh, 10 uh, members. So they have a working hour schedule. So let's just look at example, like this example. So you have a three employee and uh, their schedule one from four to eight, another one from six to 10. Another one is from nine to 11. So what you need to do is find the minimum number of employees so that the, when the employees select, the one that are not selected has some kind of overlap, at least one overlap with the one selected. So suppose they are, these are the one, for example, they are not active right now, but since they're awake, so they can contact them. So let's just assume that. So it's just like a coverage, right? You select a, a minimum set of uh, uh, slots, uh, 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 employee, so that all the ones that are not selected has at least one overlap with one selected. So wh what's the best way to, to do it? It turned out to be that uh, very simple, the, the greedy solution. The greedy solution is that you start from the beginning morning, early morning, whatever. So suppose the day start from the eight o'clock, eight o'clock a.m. Uh, people get ready. So you pick the one, uh, the first one, start first. Then you look at uh, the one that has overlap with this first one selected. Among the one overlap, you pick the one with the latest finishing time. So why you need to pick the latest finishing time? So first. Then if you select the other guy overlap with this first one, you cover all first one, the latest one hoping that you will collect, you will all, we can cover more people. Right? So that's the greedy. Right? So the argument is very simple. It's just argument using the look ahead or ahead. Um, then you can ensure that uh, that's the, the optimal. Right? And, uh, the thing that I want to make things a little bit more interesting is uh, this. Suppose you're working the hospital, uh, meaning that uh, you suppose not just covered morning from eight o'clock to five o'clock, right? And you, you want to uh, cover around the clock. So that means there is no like a starting point, right? So, so you got, your schedule is kind of very strange. So there's one guy 
can start from the 10 p.m. in the evening until five in the morning. And another guy start from three in the morning until nine in the morning. And obviously you have other guys uh, regular schedule like from eight in the morning to five o'clock in the evening, right? So it's just like around the clock. Can you modify this algorithm so that uh, you still find the minimum number of uh, person to cover all the other one, right? So let me draw a diagram to give you a visual visual explanation. So at least you see, so if I give a test in the midterm, how will you solve it? So I draw a circle like this. So it's not a, a flat. You see, initially it's like a flat. Flat means that the one straight line, uh, A, A, M to whatever, 5 p.m. Now the schedule is a kind of a weird, uh, so yeah, if, in fact, you can consider this as a, a big one because you can start 24 hour, although the clock is uh, in general is a 12 hour, but imagine this is 24 hour. So you have a, a, a slots, uh, lots of overlap slots, overlapping slots or whatever. So it's, uh, it's like this. You have lots of overlap, lots of overlap. So how would you do? Can you modify your algorithm? What's the difficulty? So first understand the difficulty. The difficulty is that in the original algorithm, it's simple because you only look at the first one, right? You, you already know the starting point. Then you look at all the other one that had overlap and you find the one with overlap with this guy and the finishing time is the last finishing time. Then the, you just pick this guy. Once you pick this guy, you eliminate all the one dominate or cover by that. Then the, you remove all this one, including this one, the selected one in the selecting set. Then you repeat the process from left to right, all the way to the end. But this one is harder. There is no starting point, right? We have to consider uh, all as a starting points or- Yeah, you, uh, you know, whatever, you, it's your choice, <laughs> your choice. Uh, but no. I, the objective maybe it, it will will be work if we start, for example, in uh, one shift and uh, uh, consider the all shifts as a starting point, and uh, yeah, then yeah, choose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a solution. Yeah, that, that definitely is a solution. Then you 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 pick any person as a starting point. Then uh, consider this is like a first one. Then uh, you you apply the same algorithm, right? You get the one solution. Yeah. Then you have another person you do again. And then the, obviously the complexity is n times whatever your previous algorithm mm -hmm. is work. Then you compare all this, you find the minimum solution. Okay. That makes sense. Right. Or oh, is there any better solution? We don't know. Okay, so at least for you to think, right? So that's why it's very important that the purpose I give all this uh, problem. So you need to fully understand. So in case I want to extend, how would you extend those kind of problem? Right? Or, or, or this time kind of generous uh, when I deduct point, I don't deduct too much. So in reality, you just, even in the book, it did not ask you the complexity or the correctness proof, right? but you should know how to prove the correctness, like optimality. I mean, sometimes you need to think a little bit. For example, the scheduling with, uh, is a weighted uh, sum, minimize the weighted sum. I mean, you need to think a little bit more right? because you can easily prove this one for two job. How you generalize to n job that you need to prove that for any sequence, the weighted sum will be larger or equal to the one with a sorted sequence, which one, two, three, four, five, based on the ratio. But the trick is just say that we learned this from the inversion example. We can easily prove that. Okay. So this is about, uh, so I spent uh, quite a lot of time, so more than half an hour. I think it's important.
the key things for you to learn and uh, from exercise you will learn more right, about this greedy approach. Okay, so let's go back to the screen and uh, we will review the material and uh, definitely we'll finish uh, this chapter today. So I want to see where's the chapter five. Yeah, chapter five. And in fact, uh, we cover a lot in chapter five. The chapter five, so what you need to learn is a couple of things. In fact, I, I taught you more than this one. But let's first review what we covered last time. It's the key is that you do a divide. Usually it's a divide by two. Then you conquer. So divide and conquer in some sense simple is that uh, you divide into two, usually like a half right, problem. So you solve two problem. So in terms of recursion, it's just like uh, if the complexity is Tn, n is the size, then you have two times Tn divided by two. Uh, the difficulty one is a merge. Merge means that once you, you solve these two separate problem, uh, how you put together this. In some cases, put together is a very simple linear. In some cases, it's harder. But I have to be careful is that sometimes it looks like a harder problem, but if you're smart, you can come up uh, a simple way to combine two separate problems. So last time we started uh, the easy one, which is a merge sort, right? merge sort. Then later we look at the example is to calculate uh, the inversion. It turned out the inversion complexity is the same as a merge sort. Actually, in fact, you can use exactly the same merge sort algorithm to find the number of inversions. So let's uh, start with the merge sort. Merge sort is a, is a simple idea. Is that uh, you divide into two, which take a constant time. So that's why we have a notation O1, right? One means constant. Then you sort. But this is exactly the same problem as the original problem, just half size. So that's why you have two copy, two times T and divide by two. Then you have two subsequence sorted. Then how you merge them to become a sorted sequence. It turned out to be easy because all you need to do is keep track. Of, uh, you have a pointer point to the smallest number, which is the leftmost. Then you compare this first two number, whichever smaller we place in the another array or whatever list. Then you advance your pointer to the right. So each time either left pointer advance one slot or right pointer advance one slot. So that's why it's linear. Because as soon as one subarray or subsequence get exhausted, then your job is done because whatever left in the other string just simply copy to the to the result. So that's uh, how we get the, this recursion, right? And uh, Last time we also mentioned that if you want to be really precise, uh, sometimes you use this uh, notation. One is the ceiling, the other one is floor. Right? But overall the complexity, you can get this n log n. And we look at the in general solution using recursion tree. This is actually the most practical way. And you just get some kind of idea. So how you derive this one. We assume that the n is two to the power of k. So then you can always divide, divide, right? Without causing, uh, worrying about the ceiling or floor. So that's the one. And we also look at the one slightly uh, tricky way to do this, like this one. Suppose it's, initially the number is odd, not even. So that's why we make things a little bit more difficult. Right? But in fact, there are, so, so that's why you say it's a little bit messy. You have to be very careful doing this mathematical calculation, ceiling and four. But there's actually for this one, you can easily also solve it in another way we didn't discuss is that they pick any number, right? You either power to the power of uh, two to K, for example, 16, eight, then it's easy, right? What happens if it's not a two to the power of K? 
what you can prove that you can always find the two number, two number, which is power two to k. Another one is power two to k plus one. For example, you have, your initial is 13. Then you know that uh, your complexity will be less than uh, 16, but the more than the eight, right? Then you can just do the calculation for A, calculation for the 16, which turned out to be the same complexity. Right? So that's why it doesn't really matter. Right? So this is another way to prove that. So the key thing, right? You find a, a, a K so that two to K, your number is larger than two to K or like larger, smaller than two, two to K plus one. And then you can solve this easily. And I give you some exercise, you already know at the master theorem, and uh, this is already learned in the, in the uh, program technique. Uh, some still ask me how to solve it. I can just give a general idea. Uh, I assume that you already know this. Okay. I think one of the homework, one or two problem is like that for homework number two. Okay. So last time I also discussed uh, some method which is interesting called parallel. So in fact, if you're talking about parallel, there are lots of variation, even for merge sort. So the easy one parallel is uh, you look at the tree, recursion tree. So you can see where we divide into various small pieces, right? Then the, you can use a lot of machine and do it very quickly. For example, you have N data, so you can use n divided by two machines. So each machine compare two elements. Then you can sort. Then you go up. So you have enough machine. So so that means all this one, all this one, right? So then each uh, each uh, uh, step like this, you can parallel like this one. These two can merge at the same time with these two. Right? So that means you don't have to do sequentially. But the problem is, still the problem, means when you merge, when you have two subsequence merge, not, not easy to do parallel. So the, the naive parallelism, we call the merge sort with parallel recursion, it still take uh, n, n, n slot, right? although it's faster than n log n. And we know that we, if we deploy n divided by two processor, it's not uh, efficient, not cost efficient means that you introduce lots of machines, but uh, you increase some kind of speed, but it's not linear speed up. The linear speed up is a log n. If you introduce n processor, linear speed should be log n. All right, so that's why we have uh, a different kind of a parallelism that dealing with a merge. So we discussed two type of merge. One's called a parallel merge, one's called multi-way merge which is very popular right now in the big data like Hadoop. Another one is a classic merge sort with parallel merge. So this is the idea for the map reduce in Hadoop. So you have a, like a four machine and, and, and this is another important thing, where you distribute the data. That's a, one of the key things. In the past, when we deal with the data, we assume that all data is in the central memory. But for this one, it's more like a data associated with different machine, like a different sites. So that's why we have a different color. For example, you have four sites, four machine. Each machine has a subset of data, right? Different color, red, blue, green, black. So what they do is that uh, initially, each you select some kind of reference point. This is where you divide the data. Divided means that you sort the data based on this reference number. So suppose uh, you have four machine, right? So you have a, a three divider means a sample. Then the, within the red, blue, green, black, uh, they divide the data based on this, uh, the reference sample. So four pieces, right? Then the, each machine send a different piece, like the first chunk to all to the machine zero, second chunk to machine one, and third one to machine two, last one machine three. Okay. Then the, you can do internally. So what, what's the difference now? Because all the smaller one, the first chunk, 
the number of data is smaller than the second chunk of sec third one and fourth one. So you don't need to do any uh, sorting anymore, right? Because they already cut into pieces with the right uh, size. The size means that uh, the range value. Then you can uh, internally you do uh, like a merge sort. Okay? For example, red with small piece with green, then blue, then black. So this is called the uh, multi-wave merge sort. The idea is using so-called uh, message passing. Message passing means that when data is in one side, you have to send data to another side. So that's why they call shuffle. You shuffle the data. So in reality, you have all kinds of, uh, 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 it, it depends how you structure data, data center, right? So, so you can imagine those T1, T0, T2, T3, like a server. And those server connected by switches. So you need to send data that, and a very fast switch or network. So this is one. And the second one is a traditional method. Traditional methods is that uh, you have a shared memory. Everyone can see those uh, data. You can access this data. But the tricky part is that when you have access, uh, how you deal with uh, a parallelism it means that what happens if we have two machines try to access the same data? Right? So that's why you have a concept called exclusive or concurrent. Exclusive means that for a particular set of data, same data, you cannot have a two machine to access at the same time. Sometimes you separate the read from write. It's okay to read, parallel read the data at the same time, which makes sense, like a picture, right? So that's on the way you access a website. Millions of people can watch a movie, a picture, no problem, because you're not change the content of the data. But when you change the content data, it's called write. So you can have all kinds of models. There's three, four model ones called exclusive read, exclusive write, or exclusive read, concurrent write, or concurrent read, exclusive write, or concurrent read, concurrent write. So that's the shared machine model. But let's focus on how we do this uh, a parallel merge. So really that, uh, suppose you have lots of machine available and lots of worker, but you have only two string, sorted string. So how can we do that? So the idea is again, divide and conquer. So divide and conquer. So how you do divide conquer? You pick the middle one of the first uh, sorted string. So in this case, a P. Then it depends on the value. So if this one is larger than the first elements of the queue, so you, you already split into two parts. One is that the white one will be one sequence to the first. Then all you need to just merge this to the dark color one, right? So you already cut the size by, by what? By about the one fourth. So it's a constant fraction. So you already reduce the size. And the same thing for that one. Well, another situation is that what happens if the last element, which is B, last element of a Q is the larger than the middle elements, which is a split location. So I always have a problem to find out the point. Yeah, this one. So that means this one is larger than the split. And it's the same thing, you can eliminate this dark color means that, that all the elements in this dark color is larger than all the other elements. So all you need to just merge these two. So you see that another one fourth of uh, elements being removed. So in the remaining situations, only the case is that this one Q, first element Q is larger than split. That means it's larger than this. And the split is, uh, is uh, larger than the, the last one, sorry. It should be the smaller. But anyway, so the idea is that you can split further the, the middle one. Then, then, then you divide this. Uh, right? So it's just like a binary search. You, you find a, a cut place and you can split into half. Not really half, it depends on cut the location. So this is a basic idea. Then, then you can uh, do the parallel merge and so on. Right, so I'm not going to discuss uh, this furthermore. Uh, maybe we, we can uh, Split, skip this one first uh, before, because I don't want to spend too much time. We want to review the, the, other, the other material.
The other material is this one, the inversion, right? Now, now you can see that uh, this is how we do this. Uh, in fact, uh, to prove our homework. Right? So just imagine we have uh, five tasks and based on the ratio should be one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, right, ratio. And then you argue that uh, for any sequence, and this sequence uh, will, will, will not be better than the previous one. So what you need to do is just do a sequence of inversion. And when we do inversion, we can uh, swap adjacent uh, slot, adjacent inversion. For example, you, you swap two and four, right? Just like uh, what I wrote at the board, right? So one and two, you swap. So you get a better result. Then after that, you two now is swapped into the C position. Then you swap uh, two with a three, right? So after this two swap, uh, you're done. So this is how you actually do adjacent uh, swap of inversion. So after that, you, you're done. Now the, this problem is uh, different. This means that uh, you want to calculate how many inversions you have. A naive approach, obviously, we say, okay, just look at each number. Then the, based on number, you, you see how many elements uh, smaller than your number, which appear before you, that it's inversion. But this one, the worst case is n squared. So you shouldn't do that. So an easy way is that the uh, same thing, you divide and conquer, you divide in two, right, constant. Then you calculate the inversion within uh, each blue and green. So the key thing is that what happened, how you calculate the inversion between the blue and the green. So it looks like it's not, not easy, right? But if, if these, uh, uh, this is just calculating inversion within, that's easy. So the key thing is that if this sequence is sorted, then it becomes very easy. All you need to do is have a pointer, just like the same as the merge sort. You move the pointer, advance the pointer from left to right, right? So at the same time where you copy the data to to the new data uh, array. So you, you, you check if there's an inversion. But you only need to check uh, one that uh, depends on your position, right? So you can calculate how many inversion. You don't need to check one by one. So that, that's, the, that's the idea. So it's very simple. You just need to look at the relative location so you know that how many data is uh, because you exempt the elements from small to large. So this is the, the algorithm. Uh, so the details are like this, just a split, right? Or sort and count, sort and count. So the key thing is like a merge and count. You see the last one called merge and count. Merge and count is just need to look. Uh, right? So this is a key. So elements inverted. So with uh, this, this number uh, less than AI. Right? Suppose A is the first, B is the second one. So if you find uh, something, B is smaller than A, so obviously it's inverted. Then how many inverted compared with this? You are, it depends on your relative location in the current list, right? current array. So you know how many. Uh, is inverted compared with your current value, okay? So for example, if a B, current BJ is smaller than AI, so what that mean? So all the elements before BJ are also inverted, right? So that's why you don't need to double count. You only need to count the relative location. Then you just keep, keep on continue, okay? So this is the, a very nice uh, a way of like applying merge sort to solve a different problem. It looks like a totally different problem. But it turns out you can use the merge sort, that is merge sort. But obviously you have to do some bookkeeping. It really means that uh, when you do a split, you do it recursive, right? So from A, you need to find the, the count, then you count the B, and you find, find the merge and count. So 
so the basic idea is that uh, this is basically the same like this. So you need to calculate the brute inversion, but itself is a divide and conquer. So you have to do recursive call. Then you count, suppose you, also, you count that. Then you count uh, the green harmony inversion, right? Already you know the method. Then the, when you compare blue and green, then you just merge them, right? You merge them. So during the merge process, you calculate the inversion between green and the blue. So that means that it's, it's like a side product of a merge sort and the same complexity. Okay, so I think uh, that's uh, what we discussed uh, last time. Any questions? I'm doing kind of very fast to review, but I think uh, it's important to review all this uh, material. Any, any discussion? If uh, no discussion, so let's look at uh, this, this problem. Anyone have some idea how to solve it? The first problem is uh, a person facing a wall with a distance uh, L, I forgot. Yeah, L. And then uh, along the long wall, left and right, there is a diamond. And unfortunately, you cannot see by eyes. You have to touch through your hand. But once you are near the wall, you can touch the wall, right? Then you can feel if there's a diamond or not. Just imagine you're like a blind person. Right? Now, the question is that uh, you don't know where is the location of a wall, I mean, the, the location of, uh, of a diamond. And assuming the distance between the person original location to the diamond is a D, D. Then you need to find a searching method so that uh, by the time you find the diamond, the total distance that you walked should be a constant of this D value. Any idea for that? Give me some idea. Uh, uh, the, the solution turned out to be a very powerful solution. To, uh, I think in later you will use. It's based on the concept of a geometric sequence. Okay. You, you know the geometric sequence is, uh, for example, you have uh, N, n divided by two, n divided by four, right? sequence of like n plus n divided by two, plus n divided by four, plus n divided by eight, and so on, all the way to, to a number, small number, like one. And this, uh, the solution also, so what I call this uh, divide and eliminate, so really means that the, how you eliminate the space, uh, uh, when you try to do explore the space, but you do not want to be too aggressive, right? Not to be too aggressive, so that uh, you, what, what you can do is, uh, or you can, for example, you aggressive means that uh, you feel that uh, the diamonds on your right, so you go all the way, right? But now the question is, that if you go all the way, you have a fifty percent of chance you never find the diamond. You're lucky you get it, and uh, it's very close to your shortest distance, which is L time plus uh, whatever the location to the diamond. But you have 50% chance you're ne never successful. Now the question is uh, how can you come up a method you alternate between left and right while still the total distance should be within a constant of, uh, of a D, D's original distance from the red point to the diamond. Anyone want to give an answer? I already gave you some hint. Professor, just a quick clarification. So D is not given to us right beforehand. But no, it's not, to... it's not given, it's not given. Oh, okay, okay. It's because not given. It, if it were given, it would be easy. <laughs> Oh, then it's too easy, right? 
Yeah. <laughs> it just kind of, you pinpoint the delocation <laughs> yeah. to Maybe. left and right. Yeah. Uh, it's um, not given, but uh, yeah. Maybe, for example, you just, you first check um, the perpendicular point. Yeah. And then you go to the right, let's say, um, some constant amount of uh, distance, let's say, um, one meter. Yeah. You check that. Then you check to the to the left, um, two meters to the left, then four meters to the right, then eight meters to the left, maybe something like that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a correct. So that's the answer. Mm -hmm. right. um, but I'm not able to uh, to prove that uh, the uh, um, the ratio is constant between this total answer and. Oh D. no, it's easy. Okay, so so let me let me let me draw this uh, this uh, picture. So how you prove this? Oh, let me let me first uh, uh, learn from other students that uh, in order to see clearly if you want to watch a video, I have disabled that. Right? Can I think you can see it now? So the key points is this. Uh, so you are here, and this is a wall perpendicular, which is uh, ninety degrees. Right? So this is a starting point. And suppose this is a D, right? So this D actually, I fool you. It doesn't really matter. What you matter is that this L, and suppose this is a D, D prime. It doesn't really matter. Why is that? Because you know this is a triangle. This D is the largest number. You know this double of, right? You know the relationship. So it doesn't really matter. Yes. yes. So what you need to try to make sure that the space you walk should be a constant of this, something like this. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So your proposal is like this one, one, this you go two, and this you get four. Yes, yeah. yes. And then you go back eight. Right. So why this is a constant ratio? It's a simple. You can, you can imagine that uh, we change it slightly, make it uh, less complicated. What you, what you do is that you go this one, this also one. To order that, you have to go to this one, right? So it's the same, go two. Then you, this one, you go to, for two. And this is a four, this is eight. Is that correct? Yeah. Right? This is also two, four, eight. Yes. And let's just, for the sake of arguing, simple. This is a, a, it's always two to the K. If you listen to the K, it doesn't matter. That's yeah. minus six. Yeah. So, so we know the geometric sequence. Mm -hmm. All this, all these things you wasted, right? This is like a waste they explore, will be less than, less than 16. Less yeah, than, that's correct. yeah. So it's no more than double that one. Yeah. Obviously you, you're doing like a left and right. So yeah. you basically do twice of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's an easy, easy constant, is it yeah. correct? Yes, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, I see. So, so, yeah. yeah. See, see now it's a very smart move. So that each time you double the distance, obviously you need to add this one, but remember the geometry sequence, all the, all the things you waste, actually you go twice like that, but you multiply by two, it doesn't really matter. And you go left, also you multiply by two, you multiply another two. So at the end, it's like eight times whatever the, the number. So it's um, still constant, is it yeah. correct? Yes, um, is there an optimal uh, geometric series uh, factor? Like here you chose two, if we choose a three, um, let's say one, then three, then nine, then 27, um, which yeah. one is better? Well, then, then you go to a little bit detail, right? Yeah. I, I, I never calculate. I think it's almost the same. Uh -huh. It doesn't really matter the, because geometry sequence always uh, follows some. The key thing is that it depends on the, how close the, your, your, your number towards this uh, two to the K. Yes. So if you just miss it, you may overshoot a lot. Yeah. But but that's not that's a minor things. Yes. Yes. See, that's actually lots of uh, nice protocol in the in the computer for number computer network. Probably you know like a TCP/IP. Yeah. You you know this uh, back off the back off means that suppose two guys want to access at the same time, there's a collision. So do you know what they do? They back off the time will be double. Uh -huh. so, yeah, I mean, there, there are lots of uh, protocol they use the concept of this kind of geometry sequence. Now you get that? So it's correct, right? Yes, yeah. 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 
So the constant is, you know, this. Uh, so you don't really worry about this D, basically this D. Mm -hmm. So this is a uh, interesting. See, this is a, uh, I never see this problem in the algorithm book, but this is a very powerful means that how you search, how you search, um, Uh, another another problem which is even more interesting, the second problem. Is, I don't want to switch to this one. If you remember this uh, this problem, I give. I need to see the number myself. Uh, what number I give you? Because the last time a student gave me the answer of. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. So so this is a fish. Uh, so fish uh, means that uh, five and uh, what's this number? 18, 18, okay. Uh, oh, I want to switch back. The reason is that I want you to read it again. Uh, so it's in some sense important. How do I share? The... Uh, professor, yeah, uh, you don't need to stop sharing every time. We can switch the screen. Oh, it's not this one. The, because I asked another student, is that if I record this one, you will not see clearly in the recording video. It's not in the uh, live class. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Yes. No. <laughs> because I, I, in some case, students want to review the, the, the recording video. I want the quality of recording video to be good. So can you see this now? Yes. Yeah, okay. So I just say that, so I'm, I, I changed the problem a little bit uh, so that uh, it's more precise. So a fish needs to be a steam between five and uh, 18 minutes. So, so really like uh, suppose you want to cook a fish, a uh, precious expensive fish, you ask your mother say that uh, how, how long I need to steam. Um, then your mother said, depends on how big your fire, whatever stove, how powerful. It's between five minutes to 18 minutes, right? That's all. And then you design a faster searching method to find the best cooking time. So you can give a try several times. So this time is not good, okay. Next time you, you will steam, you adjust your time. Right? Then undercook and overcook can be compared by tasting. So you remember the last time, this time, so you know which is the best time. But not during the cooking. So, so one student said, "Oh, what happened? Uh, I tasted after a few minutes and until, until you dump on it." But usually, the, like a Chinese tradition, you never open your, your stove, whatever, when you cook. Otherwise, the fish is no longer taste good. Right? And I assume that the one minute is a basic unit of time duration, so you don't worry about like a five minute, five minute, or five minutes thirty second or something just minutes of basic unit. So you know that the maximum number we try is from five to 18, right? So it's a 13 time, 13 time, but I don't want to do a 13 time. Uh, so one key thing is that uh, now I assume the quality of fish is a quadratic function. So it's very important, what mean quadratic function? It means that the quality of a fish, uh, if you steam a little time, so it's raw, so it's not good. So if you spend a little bit more time cooking, the quality is better. So it's going up until you reach the peak. Then it becomes overcooked, it's go down. Why this function is so important? Because every day you're facing this kind of problem. For example, right now you're a student, right? So you have only 24 hours and you want to get a good grade in my class. So you need to decide that how many hours I want to spend to, on this class to get the A. So you can start one hour, uh, obviously it's not good in general, unless obviously you, you don't feel like, uh, suppose you you, est you can do estimate every week. So see how's, the, how's the, the, the result. Or you can do it uh, eight hours a day. Probably it's overkill. You, you spend too much time and you're, you're, you're tired. You cannot really concentrate. So you, you may, in your lifetime, you always have to find the best uh, duration, for example, What's the best point uh, that's most efficient or, or maximum value? But unfortunately, you don't know this value, right? So you only know the range, this maximum value in this range. And this is a typical problem called a min-max problem. 
What does it mean max? Max means a worst case scenario, like this cooking. You don't know where's the best time. So the worst case scenario is called maximum times of try. Right? But you want to minimize this value, it's called min max. The argument for the min max usually is called adversary arguments. So really, like whatever you come up with your strategy, so we can discuss now. Your strategy, I, I'm like, a, act like a bad guy. When you select one, one cooking time, I will try to make it the best taste, more difficult to find. So this is called adversary argument. So that means the worst case scenario. Right? And last time the student told me that you tried binary search, obviously this doesn't work. Uh, so you have to be very careful. I don't, most of you like, already learned computer science for many years as you're mostly either master student or PhD student. Binary search works when you have a reference point. For example, you you know the name. For example, your 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 name is uh, Wendy, whatever. Mid, Wendy's first name. You can have a la last name. Then you need to find a dictionary. Where's where's your name? So easy way to binary search. You 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 open the dictionary in the middle, right? Then you find out whatever the the number there, or the the name there whether it's uh, behind, uh, before that or after that, you will search for the first half or the second half. But in this case, there is nothing to a reference point. Right? So if you cook in the middle, for example, middle of uh, this, uh, uh, like 11, 11 minutes. So what are you going to do? 11 minutes. Can you eliminate anything? You cannot. Right? Or some student can try the other way. So let's just explore this, uh, right? Now I need to draw this diagram, which is uh, really nice uh, in that sense. See this one? So this function is uh, kind of a weird, whatever, but it's a, uh, so, oh no, probably a little bit dramatic. Let's just, just do it for fairness. But you don't really know the peak points. Right? You don't know the peak point. So the question is that what's the good strategy? You want to minimize the worst case scenario. You want to minimize the number of tastes. You find out the best cooking time. Anyone has an idea? Um, professor, a question. Yes. Um, when you, let's say, um, observe, test it one, like for one time and you get a result, yeah. Um, you remember, you remember, you remember the taste. Yeah. Um, do you know that um, on which half of the quadratic function is this result? Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, you know. Yeah. Because you already have a five and a 18. Let, let's just do a, a sample test. Yeah. That. So suppose you, you tested eight, right? Yes. So, so you already had a value. This value is nothing wrong. You, you know exactly the quality of a fish. Yeah, um, yeah, you know it's on the left of the uh, function, not on the right. This is what I mean. No, you don't know. You don't know where you are currently is on the left of the peak or right of the peak. Uh -huh. Because that's why it makes things harder, right? Because yeah. the quality of the fish could be like this. Yes, yes, that, exactly. There is nothing you can do. Yeah. You cannot just eliminate uh, one is not enough. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see the yeah. difficulty one? Yes. The difficulty is in this one. Suppose uh, last time a student tried that, it works, right? So you say that you first tried uh, five. Yeah, okay? and then 18. And then, 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 18. then you, you put in the middle, yeah. then the middle. Then obviously you can, you can eliminate some of this, mm -hmm. right? Eliminate the half. Yeah, but you wasted three. three you, not waste means that you have a three to cut, reduce by half. So can you do better? You understand that? So this, yeah. means, what's the best way to eliminate this uh, range, uh, so that uh, so that uh, you can do it uh, with minimum number of time? Worst the case scenario, you can, you can you minimize the maximum worst the case. Scenario. Yes. And the adversary argument is this one. So this is very powerful. I will teach you this method in the last class of this. This quote. So you can say that, oh, suppose you, you pick an eight, right? You say, oh, I, I can eliminate the five and eight. 
They say, no, 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 it's not correct because you may have a situation, the peak is on the left-hand side, so you cannot eliminate. I can make you work harder or make you, like you make a wrong decision. So I'm act like a bad guy to give you all kinds of curves, but this curve is hidden from you. Yes. That's a real life, that's a real life. But property is clear, is, is quadratic function, it means that there's one peak. So always like uh, moving up, when you reach a peak, then goes down, right? So let's think about this and uh, we'll come back at the seven o'clock, we'll discuss the solution. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, so let's uh, get started. Uh, we uh, before the break we talk about this uh, like a search elimination problem, like how to find the best time for fish steaming a fish. Any idea? Maybe we we should check uh, three consecutive numbers to. Uh, okay, consecutive number. Two consecutive number. Uh, to get if it is increasing or decreasing. Okay. If it okay. Neither increasing or nor decreasing. Uh, we know uh, that. Okay. Now the question is a consecutive number. Which one? The middle or left or right? Uh, maybe middle three numbers. Oh, three number, not not two number. Ah. Uh, three is a uh, waste. Maybe Ah, maybe two, yeah. Two yeah, maybe. two, two should be should be good, right. <laughs> yeah, two, two, yeah. two is good. So you're 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 quite good, but it's not optimal. Let me tell you what, what's the scenario. Okay, actually, it's a very nice. This is uh suppose a twelve and thirteen, right? So something like a middle. The yeah, correct? yeah. So, if if it's increasing, uh, which means that thirteen is uh, more tasty than yeah, yeah. So we eliminated uh, the half. left. Yeah. Yeah, you eliminate half. You only need uh, two sample to eliminate half. Is it correct? Yeah. So, yeah. so, so that's the idea. But I will tell you this is not optimal. Why is that? Because I can make your life miserable in the next round. Next round is this one. Suppose, can, you, can everyone see now? It's a clear, right? I mean, his proposal is like a two middle point, 12 and 13. And uh, suppose this is increasing. So obviously, the other side is decreasing, right? So if for this one, if one is decreasing, you can eliminate the other part. So you can always eliminate half of them. It's correct. There's nothing wrong. So two tastes, you eliminate half. So it looks like uh, ideally you can do it uh, like uh, two times, uh, whatever. It's like a log in. But you, you cannot do that. Why is that? Because after you eliminate half, I will make your life miserable. Really means that after you eliminate, so this becomes the boundary, right? Is this a boundary? I mean, nothing, because that's the leftmost. This 13 is really close to the leftmost. Now the question is, where are you going to sample the next? You still, you still try to, to sample to, to the middle? Can yeah, my know? idea was that, but <laughs> every, every time sample, but, but it's not, <laughs> it's, you, it's still not good enough. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. You, you can see that it's kind of expensive, right? Yeah, I mean, you can do it. this, this is a way uh, you can do the two, but you, you, you may end up uh, a, a lot. So, 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 where, what's the next one? like uh, 15, 15 and uh, 16. Is it correct? Uh, 15 and 16. 15 and 16. Then you can eliminate uh, some of this. Now, is it a 15 or 16 or you want a 14 and 16? So it doesn't uh, really matter much. Yeah, maybe not much. Yeah, it doesn't matter. But I think eventually you have to taste, uh, for example, six. Right? But is there any better way? I mean, this work, but probably not the optimal one. Can we do one third and two thirds of the max uh, minus min distance, and then we can discard uh, on average two thirds of the of the search space? Two thirds? Yeah, yeah. That that that's another approach. So in our case, I think that would be like nine and fourteen, I believe. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, that 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 work. Okay, so this nine and thirteen. Is that correct? Uh, thirteen or fourteen? I mean, it, it, it's not like. Oh, okay, number, okay. Right? So so it that doesn't 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 matter. Doesn't really matter. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter. But now after, uh, so I eliminate one of this, right? Then where 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 you place this uh, 
uh, after that. So the, the challenge is this is actually very good. You, you're quite close. Now the distance between this is not the one third of the remaining one. That's a challenge, right? No, it's your, your, right. your idea is like a divide in the third, like three pieces equal length. When you take out this one, so the distance between this is still four. Now this one is shorter one. So where you place this one? You want to place somewhere here or Right. So, 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 what's the strategy in general? Because the what, whatever the remaining uh, uh, sample is no longer the proportion you you want. Your your idea is proportion is that always keep one third, one third. Is that is that your idea? Yeah, I was thinking that uh, when we when we put like the two reference points, we could also discard the right part. But yeah, we don't know if it's overcooked, right? We only know yeah. that it's undercooked. No, no, idea is still correct. But just that whatever the remaining one, this could be uh, somewhere in the middle, closer to the middle, after you take out that one, it's no longer, you understand? So this portion is no longer one third of from nine to 15. Uh, so yeah, and understood. Yeah, that's yeah. Clear. now the question is where we're going to, to sample the next one, right? Uh, you want to make a still this one the same length or this one you put in half. So this makes things a little difficult. You may not get the optimal one. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. But you understand, right? So, so I mean, you're quite close. So, so in the sense that uh, you want to keep this proportion still, still the kind of same. Professor, can we take like more divisions? Uh, you can so... more divide, yeah, but you, you taste more. So you waste of uh, try. Like if we take the derivative of that slope uh, between two points. No, 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 no. Slope doesn't make any, any difference. Okay. I, I don't have any assumption of the slope. Professor, after first step, uh, when we uh, choose two ones, uh, we have something uh, to compare, yeah? Yeah, you can compare. You, you, you can always eliminate the left or right. That, that's correct. And if we started after, after for example, uh, first to, uh, it's not enough to uh, choose uh, one middle after second part. Yeah, no, no, not enough. You have to have a two, two. You have to have a two sample, right? To eliminate uh, either left or right. One yeah, yeah, but two. after first step, when when I firstly elim eliminated, for example, left part. Yeah. Uh, and I have some um, uh, results for 12 and 13, for example. No, 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 use this example. So you have a result for nine and 14, right? So what are you going to do? I mean, nine is basically useless because that's the leftmost. You have to you have, to have another sample, is that correct? Because you, you want to reduce the space. Now that your previous sample, you eliminate this one, this sample is no longer useful. Now you still have a, this uh, 14 sample, you have to, put somewhere here or you put somewhere there, one more sample to eliminate space. What you try to do is that uh, accumulatively you eliminate as much space as possible so that you can uh, reduce the, you get a mid max result. Do you understand? Look at this example. I mean, where you want to sample this one, right? Okay, let me just give you the result that you can think about that. It turned out the best sequence is a golden ratio. It's like a Fibonacci number sequence. So the Fibonacci number you probably know is that the Fibonacci is a zero, zero, one, two, three, eight, nine, and uh, 13. So the reason I give you five and uh, 18, so if you shift the, the position, so it's a zero to 13. So your best position is eight. So in other words, the distance, uh, whatever you should, the distance between this and, and that. So you, your two sample is one should be eight, the other one is five. Or in other words, if we convert this one, 
So 5 plus 5 is a 10, plus 8 is 13. That's the, the one. Why is that? That's a key thing, right? Why is that? Remember the second student gave me a good, kind of good answer, it's like a one third, very close. Really means that when you take out this one, take out this one, and then I argue that this position is no longer like an ideal position. But this golden ratio, still the ideal position. So that's the key things. Right? So that means the distance, then all you need to do is have another sample. You have an A and nine, then you have another sample is a three. So that means the distance between left and the right still the same. So you get that? So probably this is not really proportion. So if we really draw proportion, 18 should be somewhere here. If you take out this one, so next sample should be here is a 15, 15. So in this way, the maximum number of sample you get is A, A5321. So it's only five sample, right? Although this uh, Fibonacci, you probably know this Fibonacci number is not really golden ratio. It's close to golden ratio. But I force it to, for you to select the integer number. So that's the best number sequence to uh, uh, resemble a golden ratio, right? So for those who are not, forget about the golden ratio. So let me just do it. It's kind of, uh, maybe I, I don't know. Let me, let me give a piece of paper you probably know. Golden ratio really means that this one. So you have a piece of paper. So this uh, side divided by this, is a golden ratio. If, look at the shape of this one rectangle shape. So if I fold it, if I fold it like this, you see I fold it, I take a square out, take a square out. Look at this one folded. I take the square out, I get another smaller rectangle. Look at that one. If this rectangle resembled the original shape, then that's the golden ratio. Okay. So if you do this kind of a simple mathematics, this divide by this, this divide by this, this divide by this, you keep on dividing, and this ratio is getting closer, closer to the golden ratio. So that's the that's the trick. Okay, so let me let me do this one more time. So I gave you a five to 18. So what you need to do is just to start with a zero. You start with a zero. So you just shift the position, right? Shift the position from zero, this is 13. Then your best two sample is the, in the Fibonacci sequence is one is eight, the other one is five. Maybe I exaggerate a little bit. Okay. No, this this five is not in this location. Five is somewhere here. This is five. Then again, you have a two scenario. Remember the key things are distance. You see, that's the second student is correct. But the key is not really one third. This distance one five, this also five. For it doesn't matter. You delete the left part or right part, it's the same. Quality is the same, right? So that's adversary argument or whatever left or right, this is the same. So suppose we eliminate this one. So the key thing is that the last time I said that this sample is no longer useful, but you want to make sure this original eight is still the ideal position so you can use in the next cut. So it turned out to be, it's the ideal position really means that the distance between five and eight is three. So all you need to do have another sample is at the 10, so that the distance between this is three. So that's, that's the three. So next time you tried A and 10, then it makes life much easier, right? So again, you have a scenario like you eliminate one of these, suppose you eliminate uh, 10 to 13. So what's left? What's left is, uh, five, A, and 10, right? So let's just remove this five and 10. 
Now we are in this Fibonacci sequence of five. The next one, you pick a one that uh, close to five by distance by two. So this would be seven. Okay, now you, you see that you're getting closer. Then it depends on whatever you eliminate left or right, depends on that. You eliminate two units. Then uh, you, you will continue. So one more, you just try one more sample that, that's done. No matter what, you either sample the six or you sample the nine. So the total number of tastes is equivalent to the Fibonacci number within this range, zero and 13. And the ideal samples always follow the Fibonacci number. Is that kind of magic? Right. Or you, you, you can try to your, your, your algorithm to see if it can beat this, this algorithm. Uh, assuming the initial sample, uh, initial the range, I mean, the range is a Fibonacci range, Fibonacci number range, which is 13, right? Or next one is, uh, you, you, you can calculate, right, 21. So you just always use this Fibonacci number to sample. Did you get that? But if you, if you change the problem to, to any, any real number, not integer number, then actually it's easier. All you need to do is just find the golden ratio point, which is 0 0.28, golden ratio. You're just assuming that the, given the, the length right, as a one unit, you just pick up the golden ratio point. That's the best uh, time. Right. I'm kind of surprised, I don't know, maybe I should ask my colleague why this kind of method never discussed in computer science, which is more important than binary search. Okay, in terms of uh, minimize the number of search points. All right, let's uh, stop. Uh, do we need any discussion or I think it should be enough. Professor, you mentioned that for real numbers we should use the golden ratio point, yeah. right? But yeah, for, I mean, but for real numbers, we if we sample just a single point, I mean, the search space is like in, infinite. I mean, incomparable. Oh no, right? yeah, but you still have assume they have a, a stopping point. When 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 the two samples are getting very very close, you stop. Oh, okay, okay. Right, okay. You, you understand one golden ratio is really mean from left. Golden ratio is zero point uh, eight two five. And then another sample is from right, golden ratio that. Then yeah, you know, eliminate, we have uh, like some epsilon, some buffer around. Yeah, yeah, part yeah, part. then you epsilon, yeah. you just yeah. continue until this sample getting so small and you stop. That's the optimal sample. Uh, assuming that the function is a quadratic function. Okay, so let's uh, stop. Now let's go back. Uh, we cannot carry away too much. Uh, it's really exciting, but uh, oh, where's the, where's my algorithm? Slice. Oh, number five. Okay, now let's uh, look at a couple more questions. A problem then to, uh, we call for a day. Oh, yeah. You have a question? No, arrival, arrival. Huh? Arrival, arrival. Arrival. Yeah. Okay. Some student. Okay, now let's uh, find out some more interesting uh, question, uh, which is a very uh, important things for uh, many applications, including the image process, computer vision, graphics, uh, geographic information. So give you endpoints in a 2D space, right? And you want to find a, a pair of points, uh, smallest utility and distance between them. So basically you want to find out the closer distance, two points. An easy solution always in comparison, right? So I mean, for each point you compare with the other endpoints or n minus one points, but you have to do a pairwise comparison in n square. And uh, surprisingly, you can do it, uh, uh, by the way, if it's one dimension, it's relatively easy. Uh, you can do a log n, n log n. If on a line, a line is easy, but 2D is a little bit more difficult. So you always think, uh, oh, maybe two, 
two n square should be the best way you can do. They look like a, but in fact, uh, you can find a better solution. Uh, so we will uh, teach you a method only using n log n. And later, if we have time, there, there is even a, another algorithm using only n. Surprise me, you only need n to find the uh, uh, two closest point by using probabilistic method, randomized solution. So this is the one. Um, suppose, uh, so this gave you an idea, like you have a, a region, right? Suppose you can divide into uh, four quadrant, then you just kind of like divide and conquer. So size of left and right, I mean, X and Y by half. The problem is uh, when you do this kind of divide, just like a quick sort, uh, if you are not uh, careful, you may not get a divide into, into uh, exactly one fourth. That is too much work. So this is the idea if you can do divide in four, assuming that uh, no two points with same X on the same Y location. So that means we'll not be on the same line or column. But so this is sort of first attempt. So first divide four quadrant is impossible. So that to ensure that each quadrant has about uh, n divided by four points, like this example, it's impossible. You can divide on from the X, but you cannot divide on the Y. Is that correct? So that's why it's better just not to divide into four, you divide into two, right? So that's the idea of divide into two. Uh, and later we see another example. In some cases, it divides into four. But this case, of four is too much for I ask uh, because you cannot really divide. You divide into two, right? So the basic idea is divide into two. Uh, based on this x value, that's uh, relatively easy. Right? So you just scan from left to right until you reach uh, a middle point, right? Suppose this is a middle point. Then uh, what you try to do is that uh, you solve it recursively. So that part is very much like the same uh, uh, two problem we discussed, right? about the inversion and uh, merge sort. So suppose you solve the left uh, to closest distance and right to close distance. That's not hard. The hard part is the middle one. Middle means a merge. How you combine this one? Really there may be some points between left and right. They're the closest, okay, right? Do you see this uh, points here? And these two points are very close. Right? So how we deal with this situation? This looks like a very messy. So that means you have to be a very creative. So let's just look at an example. In this case, the left hand side, the two close point is supposed to be units of 12. The right the closest point is 21. Now we have to deal with the middle one, middle one between two boundaries. So the key observation is this one. It turned out once you find out the minimum pair distance, left or right, then you can use this uh, measure like 12 to give a boundary of uh, the middle part so that you can reduce the search space. That's a very important idea of uh, minimizing this uh, search space or you have some kind of uh, it's like elimination, right? So you can eliminate a certain space because I already find the best one is 12. So you don't need to worry anything more than 12. So that's the side idea. And this approach we also use, although it's totally different application, like a dating problem, remember? We're talking about like you date uh, in person, you have to do date a sequential one. And for each date, you have to make a decision, either yes or no. But uh, what's the best algorithm? So what you, what you do is divide into two stage. The first stage, you just remember uh, whatever the best value you have so far. Then the second stage, you find the first person that can beat the first stage. Then you just decide yes. So it's like a similar idea. So the key thing is that you try to use the knowledge you obtain so far, 
which is the minimum distance between left and right. So in this case, it's 12. But in this case, you have eight, right? But one thing you can observe is that you already have 12. You only need to worry about a small set of uh, uh, nodes that close to the boundary. Right? So that's how you solve the problem in a nice way. So ideally what you try to do is just need to find the three places, one left and the right, one is in the middle. Okay. So the key thing is that you remember the distance, which is the very important distance, the delta. In this case, a minimum of 12 and 12. Then the, the next thing is you need to define a boundary. That's the key, boundary. So the region, the middle region, left delta, right delta. That makes sense, right? Why is that? The reason is because anything above the delta or more than the delta distance will be longer than 12. So in order to jump, it's like a border, right? So you, you, for left to jump to the right, it takes two delta, there's no, no need, right? So, so so that means you can reduce the space into this shaded area. Then more, little bit more observation. Uh, then how are we ready to check? So what you can check, you can sort this data. You see this data from Y location, Y location from lower to the top. Now the question is like, uh, uh, again, I have trouble to use the point, yeah. Like this one. So this is the lowest one. So how far, how far means above, right? You need to consider. Again, the base of this delta value. So what we can try to do is to divide the space into a grid based on this delta value. Then all we need to do is say how many grids we need to, to look. Right? So that's the, the idea. So it turns out it's a very simple. So we once if we divide a grid into, remember this is a delta region, a grid is a one half or one half, one half of delta, one half of delta. Right? So you can obviously can see that uh, there is no way you can put the two data, two data or two points in the same grid. The reason is we know already, right? No matter it's left or right, uh, we already find the minimum distance is delta. This grid is half, so I mean half, half. And uh, suppose you are here and you don't need to go very far above, right? Go far above. For example, your point here, you don't need to go to very far above. So all you need to do is just count the number of grids, right? number of grids. So it turned out uh, 12 grids is more than sufficient. So really means that suppose you sort these uh, points are based on the y value, sort it. So that means if you have a point, you only need to look at the, within the 12, right? So within the 12. The reason is that if more than 12, the distance between i and j is already more than delta. That's a very simple mathematics because you know already the grid size. That's actually a very rough estimation. In reality, this 12 can be reduced to seven, but, but we don't really care about whether it's 12 or seven. It's a constant number. Or in other words, for all this number, you sorted based on the border, sorted by Y, each number just to compare the neighbor within the 12. So is this a linear solution? Yes. So all you need to just look at the linear, right? Linear means that uh, those, those points. So again, let me just repeat. You, you can sort uh, the data based on the X, right? Then you have uh, the middle point. Then you, you can extract all the data within this delta left or right. Then about all this data, you can sort based on the Y. Uh, then you partition the space based on the grid size. The grid is a half delta. Remember the delta is a minimum of a left and right. You already have it. 
Then for each data, you only look at a constant number of a neighbor because of this theorem. Because above that, it's more than delta. So you don't need to look at that. You can eliminate that. And so the total cost for the middle one is the order of n. So that's the, the basic idea. So I don't think I need to go through those uh, detail. Although there are some points where you have, uh, uh, now the question is that it's a recursive, right? Recursive really means that uh, when you do left and right, so you need to further partition. Do you need to sort it again? And in reality is not, you can just globally sort on, along the left, on the, on the Y, then you can extract. So those are little details, the data structure is not that important. Right? So the key thing is that uh, you can reduce this one to, to N. So that's the key, it's not N log N. Although over there is N log N. The reason is that you can do a better way. So you only need N, right? N means that the boundary points, you really need to, to do N units. So that means you don't need to sort again and again, you only need to sort once along the Y. Okay, so that's the kind of very interesting things. The key idea is that you get the knowledge from the left and right in front of the delta minimum distance and use that knowledge to reduce your search space between the boundary. And then you sort the data, then the, each data need to compare with a constant number of neighbor based on the restriction of data, delta value. Now the question, can you do better? Uh, surprisingly, it's yes, it's really counterintuitive, but we, we, we will not discuss now. If we have time, we, we will, but it's unlikely if you're really interested you can look at the book chapter 13 about randomized solution. And you can, uh, the execution time is in. Okay. So that's the, about the, the second one. So you can see that all the example we look at so far is like a partition the half, start with merging, then the reversion, uh, re, uh, inversion, calculate inversion, which is a special case application of uh, merge, but then we talk about the uh, closest point, pair of points. Uh, it's also divided the two, but it's, uh, you have to be a little bit more creative, you get more insights on how you find out the, the solution across uh, two, two area, right? The idea is you restrict uh, the searching space based on the knowledge of a delta. Any questions? Am I going too fast? Uh, there, there's a couple of more uh, uh, problems, I mean, in the, in the book. So we don't have time to go through all of them. Right. Okay, let's look at the one more, which is, I just added, it's really interesting and very surprising to you. Really mean that uh, multi, integer multiplication, and you probably didn't realize that there's a faster way to do multiplication. Uh, this uh, looks a little bit uh, messy. Probably I will stop the sharing, show you an example, show you an example. I don't know if I should use the example in the book or not. Uh, maybe I can use the example in the book. In the book uh, shows the example. Yeah, if you turn to page uh, 232, page 232, there's one example. Oh, why is that? I cannot see myself. Okay, so let's uh, let's do this example. Uh, 
the example is uh, typically when we do multiplication is that uh, suppose you have an n, n times n, right? So that means n digits times n digits. The complexity is, is n squared. Uh, let's just look at example like uh, 12 times 13, how we do it. We get uh, six, three, two, one. They add this, right? That the solution, right? So that's the that's the one. But you can do some uh, calculation, or whatever. It's it's n square. Uh, so the idea is this one: the, we do a divide and conquer. Suppose you have uh, a two number. It's like this, uh, just hypothetical the number. Multiply this right? this two number. What we do is that we split this into half, split this into half. Oh yeah, this carry different weight and this carry different weight, right? This is a hundred, hundred, right? So that means in the, in the system that depends on the, whether it's a binary or decimal, it's a decimal system, 10 times uh, two, right? Then you divide into like a, uh, different pieces, right? So suppose this is X and this is Y. So they call this one the yeah, X1, X0, Y1, Y0. Do you understand that? So this is X, this is Y. So key thing that you separate these two, half and half. So basically when you do calculation, you divide this into two, four different pieces, four different pieces. Uh, so you remember, uh, again, you have a very large uh, number, integer number, each number divided by half, and then uh, two pieces, and you multiply these two pieces. And that's, that's the idea. But uh, if you analyze this, you find out that this will not really help you anything. In fact, uh, the, it's more complex. But then we see how we resolve this issue. All right, so this is uh, how we do it. So by half and half, right? Do you see this diagram? So remember this X becomes X1 and X0, but this is uh, just whatever the weight. This Y1 and Y0, then you just multiply. Right, you multiply. Or oh, this is based on two, or oh, it's whatever, it's decimal. Or oh, this is a binary system. It's not that important. You can, if a decimal is just 10. Then you multiply. So you multiply, you multiply is x1 times x y1. So that's the key. Then, but this is the uh, two to the n, right, the position, right? Then uh, for this part, then you have a same kind of weight here, the x1 times y0 plus x0 times y1. And then the last part, that's the least significant part. Right? So it's x0, y0. So suppose you calculate each one, each one, right? Then you can just add this together, it's very simple. That's a recursion. But the problem is that this recursion, what's the complexity? So the complexity is this one. You divide the, the size of X and Y by half. So that's why it's a N, you see this a TN, right? TN, suppose this complexity X times Y. So now it's like you have a full copy, full copy of a half size, it's a half size half size, but you have a full copy, so it's four times. So it turns out this will not really help you anything. You can do some simple calculations, turn out to be n squared. So it's the same complexity as the original one. So this divide and conquer doesn't really help you. But now let me show you how you make a trick 
you can reduce the four to three. That's a big deal. Okay, how can you reduce, how can you really remove one calculation? The trick is this one, is this, uh, we know this property, this one, x1 plus x2, this is a plus, okay, whatever the number you plus. Now y1 plus y0, when you do this multiplication, you get x, y1, y0, right? you get all this combination, right? But all together, add together. You see that this one is the same sequence. Look at this one, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. zero. But they are combined, only one number, right? So the trick is this one. So what we can do is that uh, we only need uh, this one, 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 zero and zero. These two together is fine, right? You can put together, you don't need to separate this. So that's why it's a three, three copy. The question, how can you give us three, get us this three copy, this together? You have like a one call for this one, you get these whole things. Then you try to get uh, x1, y1, and if you can get the zero, x0 zero and y0, then you just subtract these two from this number, then you get this middle one. So that's the whole idea. So let me just repeat. This recursive uh, multiplication is doing this one. Again, you have a, like a multiple position, right? They split in half. Then the first uh, uh, significant bits we call x1. Uh, the other portion of low significant bits, the least significant bit part is x0. Saying y, y1, y0. Then you just need to do a simple computation, which is adding. Direct add, x1 add to x0, direct add. Right? There's no position, direct add. y1 add to y0. Then you call a recursive call multiply. Now you're doing something multiply for this one. Right? You see p value, this p. So as a result, this multiply, you get this four terms. As we show above, right, four terms, this four terms. And this four term, when you, okay, so we see how we use this, make use of this P. Then how the key thing is how you get X1 and Y1. It's easy, just do X1 multiply Y1. Another one recursive call X0 multiply X0. Okay, so when you do that, that's your two call, right? This is the third call, the mid, this one. And the size is really the same. Then the, what you do is that you return the value should be x1, x0, or y1, you already get that. And this is a p-value originally calculated, which is four terms, subtract to when we calculate y1, x1, x0, y0. Then basically it's the same as this term. And this thing you already calculate. So it's a very smart way you just do a three, three recursive call and by subtracting this call from the other two, so you can get uh, four or three terms we really want, which is x1, y1, x1, y0 plus x0, y1 as one unit, the x0, y0. Okay, then how you calculate this uh, complexity? It's the same idea is that uh, this is the, same size, why this is the same size? This is a plus, it will not change the, the bits, right? So it's a half of, suppose you have like a, I don't know, 32, 32 bits. This divide, right? So it's a 16 bits. You two number add this to 16 bits. So it doesn't really matter, you maybe to uh, 17 bits, but it's, it's close to the half. So that's why you, you are making a big change of a three recursive call instead of four recursive call. So that's the difference, okay? So that's why it's a three copy of a half size, the digits size, number of digits. And this N is just a simple manipulation. So order of N. So at the end, uh, you, if you solve this recursion tree, so we know that you can get this log base two 
three, which is less than two. It's 1.459, right? So at least asymptotically, this is a very nice algorithm. But this only apply when you multiply a very large number with lots of digits. So you can improve. So this is another kind of surprising uh, use of uh, divide and conquer to speed up the calculation, normal multiplication. Because we normally don't realize that. You can have another way to do uh, calculation it will computationally much uh, smaller than the normal one. Why it's not really used uh, in the practical life or real life? The reason is that uh, you don't deal with really this large number multiplication. And uh, in reality, people will not do it manually anyway. <laughs> we just put the calculator. Right? So that's the one of the interesting application, so it's uh, useful for us to discuss. Any, any questions? Any question we can discuss? If no, then the we'll, we'll, we'll discuss uh, the, I think we still have some time, we'll at least give you some idea of uh, next chapter. By the way, uh, I already assigned uh, homework, right? So the due date will be next week. Right? So you know homework number two. Any question about that? Are we ready for the next chapter? We probably will not go through any detail, but just some of the idea. So next chapter is kind of important. Uh, it's another very useful technique we call the dynamic programming. Uh, as we go along, uh, especially, uh, you see the greedy usually is, uh, you get the idea like usually it's a linear, right? It's a greedy. Although not all the cases linear, but all the example we see is linear. And then when we have a divide and conquer, uh, likely we get like n log n solution. So slightly more complex than greedy. It depends on whether we have a, a very simple merge, right, or we combine. If you're very simple combine, then the complexity is small. Otherwise, it's a, it's a little more complex. Then dynamic programming is even more. Right? So the idea is that uh, the major difference is that Divide and conquer is like a very clean. You divide the problem into usually like a half, split, like a partition. So you break a problem into sub-problem, solve each problem independently, and combine solution right, to sub-problem. But dynamic programming is uh, slightly different. It means that you cannot really partition the problem. You can't uh, break up the problem into a series Overlapping some problem, not not uh, uh, not uh, uh, separate, not a partition. It's overlap. So that's why usually the solution tend to be a little bit more complex. So you see the different one is like a partition. Partition means that uh, there is no overlap. But dynamic programming for some scenario you have to uh, look at the. Uh, different overlap means different combinations, okay? So let's, uh, so the key thing is that you have an overlap. Now like I give you a set, if you, have, oh, you want to find the overlapping subset, it's too much, is it correct? That's the, the difficult one. So that's the key thing about the challenge of dynamic programming. So when I teach you dynamic programming, I need to teach you. So how, what's the key things to solve a problem in dynamic programming? Uh, you cannot just say overlapping subproblem. That's too general. Why is that? Because give you like a 10 elements. How many subset of 10 elements? You have two to 10. That's uh, it's too much, right? It's not polynomial. 
So the idea is that uh, somehow you can you can arrange uh, some kind of sequence in some order so that you don't have to look at all the subproblems, but maybe follow a sequence. For example, suppose we have a 10 elements. Now let, let me show this one. I think this is even more important than I give you a solution, but that's a, that's a way to tell you how you solve a dynamic program. So I cannot just stop. Okay, I can stop. Okay. So the key thing is that the overlapping. So as I say that you have like a one, two, three, like elements. So in the divide and conquer, you, you say, okay, we you cut this uh, five and six, right? Like when we say, okay, you solve this one and you solve this one, easy. So each problem divide into two problems, sub problem. It's easy. That's why we get mostly like this uh, two copy of, then depends on whatever, uh, the the combine is f function, so you get that right. So you this is the, always the one. Now for dynamic programming, the problem is not that simple. It's not like from five one to five six to ten. So you said okay, we look at all the overlapping, but now the question is there's so many overlapping. You can have like a one two three, then the three five three four five. Oh, maybe like a three, uh, three, six, seven, there's another overlap, then six, four. See, there are so many overlapping problems. There's no structure and maybe too many. We know that from this one, the total number, number of a subset, subset is two to the cardinality of uh, whatever A, right? So that means two to the 10, so too much. So what we try to do is that if we can forming some kind of uh, a sequence, whatever the sequence, then uh, you follow certain subsequence. You may you may have some overlap. For example, you have uh, this one, two, three, two, three, four, some kind of sequence. So that means those overlapping sequence has some kind of uh, limit. It's not too many. You don't need to look at all this possibility. So that's that's the key things about 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 this. Or you 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 look at the elements one at a time right, to see whether you include or not include. So that's that's another solution. For example, these are the activity one, two, to ten. You start with one, then you next one you include the two, and you decide whether you want to include or not include. You have two choices and then another one. So, so some kind of uh, the structure, right? not to consider all the possible overlapping subset, otherwise it's too much. Obviously the best way you have to look at one example. So let's start with one example. Uh, we call this, uh, are we very familiar with this one? And the problem is called I'm not going to go through this one. Weighted interval schedule. We already know the interval schedule, right? So we find a good a greedy solution based on the finishing time. If you remember that we have a, a bunch of tasks, bunch of tasks, and then the, you need to select a maximum number, not duration, based on number. So what we do, the greedy is a, you, you pick the one with a minimum finishing time, uh, then you move from left to right. That's greedy one. But what happens if we assign the weight? Weight really means that each element has a weight. Has a weight. And then the, you want to find the maximum weighted uh, sum. Okay. By the way, this one problem. Uh, uh, you have to be very careful. When you add a weight, could, it doesn't mean that it would make a problem difficult or the same. It depends on the problem. 
Like the problem I gave you the homework, remember? And we want to find uh, the minimum weighted sum. That problem you can solve optimal using greedy solution. But for this problem, you cannot be using greedy solution. Okay, so also you, this, although this one also called to find the maximum weight. Uh, so you want to find a subset with the maximum weight. So why the finishing time no longer work? Uh, it's very simple. It's just giving example, right? So suppose you have a two job, right? Two job, one is A, the other one is B. So I didn't show that it could be have some C or it doesn't really matter anymore. If you just say that you want to find the job with uh, with uh, with uh, finishing time first, it obviously that don't work. Although this is quite long, but its weight is very high, so it's better to to select that one, right? So that's very obvious. And if everyone's weight's the same, then it's just based on the finishing time. Okay. Uh, the detail I'm not going to go through this. So the idea is still quite simple. Is remember when I mentioned this earlier, like you have a lots of uh, subset. What you try to do is to label those tasks. Right? So in this case, the label is based on the finishing time, still based on the finishing time. So you see that you have a task. You don't label based on the start time. You find finishing time. This first, second, and third, right? Then what you try to do is do it uh, like a sequential decision is to see that uh, you first include one, right? Then the, you need to decide uh, whether you want to include two or not. Obviously in this case, two cannot be. Then you look at the three, right? And so on. So you do this kind of uh, a decision. But, but for each case, you have a choice of either include, not include. Then you can get uh, the comparison on the scenario. But be careful when you include something, when you include something, uh, include something, you have to disable all the one that uh, is in conflict with, right? So for example, if you want to include eight, so this is a meaning P, you want to find the, the largest index before that, that has no conflict with eight. So that's very important, right? So in other words, in order to include A, you cannot include the six and seven, okay? So this uh, notation is very important. Really means that for each task, you find the, the largest index, which is smaller than your index, that is still compatible with you. So this will help you to do this uh, like a recursive call, which is dynamic programming. Uh, probably I'm not going to go through this uh, uh, in any detail. So the idea is this key thing is this one. So we have an idea, like we define concept called optimal, optimal J. So really means that the optimal solution, if you include from one to J, from this sequence, you can select a subset. Right? So that means you increase this within one to J, what's the optimal one? You don't have to include all of them. So the key thing is that in, you can do a recursive. How you do it, it's in some sense, it's simple. So for this one, J zero, it's easy. For J not zero, you have two choices. You either include this J or not to include J. So what does really mean? If you include J, you want to, this optimal one means that your optimal value. So this is a weight, right? It's a profit. Then this profit plus what's the optimal solution for the, your, the last index, this PJ is the last index that has no conflict with you. Or in other words, this really means that, uh, suppose you are considering eight, right? Now, whether you want to include A or not, you have two choice. If you include A, 
then you add your weight. Then what you need to do is find out the best uh, solution for the remaining one is from one to one to five. Is it correct? From one to five, you find the best solution because you cannot include the six and seven anymore. If you include the eight, it's fine. Then you find from the best solution from one to five. So this is just like a recursive call, right? So that's the idea. Then another option is that obviously if you don't select A, if you don't select A, then you're free to select the optimal one from one to seven. See, this is how we reduce the dimension, right? So let me just repeat. So you do it uh, one by one, the number. Suppose you reach A, make a decision. The, the solution of optimal from one to A is you either include A. If you include A, it's simple. You just add uh, its value plus the optimal solution from one to five. What's the five? Five is the largest index, smaller than eight, and it's still compatible with A, no conflict. And another possibility is that you don't include A. In this case, the optimal solution without A is optimal solution from one to seven. So in this way, we do this recursive. So once you have a recursive call, then you can easily calculate. So then you remember for each this value and this value, it's just like a sub problem and it's overlapping, right? It's of overlapping. So basically this one is called for A, imagine this call for A, this call for five, right? This call for seven, right? So this, in this case, you have a reduction of, uh, of index. Eventually you reach one or zero, you stop. So that's the basic idea of uh, uh, dynamic program. It's like a recursive call, uh, like a divide and conquer, it's a slightly different. It's not like a split, there's overlap. But this overlap may also cause a problem because you tend to do the redundant calculation. And we'll see how we resolve this redundant calculation through memorization in the next class. Okay, so I think that with this, we finish uh, today's uh, lecture. Any questions or comments before we stop? So if no questions, so uh, let's stop for tonight. So have a good night. Thank you, Professor. Bye.